Well, when you see headlines like this, and thermals in Phoenix are climbing up to 18,000 feet, you begin to look for a lot of reasons to escape to the cool mountain country. Hi, I'm Preston Westmoreland, and we have found the perfect place. You're about to discover one of flying's great thrills, airplane camping in the Idaho wilderness. Imagine this, a turf strip where you can camp right by your plane, fish in a nearby stream, and explore a fascinating area. A lot of western states have these airplane campgrounds, but of all the states, Idaho has the most extensive system of all. It used to be that you had to find out about these by word of mouth, but today, Wide World of Flying will show you how to get more information. You'll fly some of the approaches that are tailored to the exact terrain of each individual airport, and you'll find out how to get more information. As you can see, we have a lot of gear to pack, and uh, you want to start loading, and I'm going to do the weight and balance here, or what? I have a better idea. I'll do the weight and balance, and you do the loading. It always happens like this. <laughs> Remember, the key to enjoying the wilderness is the preparation you put into the trip. Every camper likes to decide how primitive an experience it'll be, and as you can see here, we like to be comfortable. In fact, it's kind of like stuffing a telephone booth. A lot of our smaller items are packed into larger containers for easy loading and unloading. A word of advice, be ready for anything. Take extra meals in case you get weathered in, rain gear, a good toolkit and survival pack. By the way, watch your weight and balance, especially in the excitement of packing for vacation. For most pilots, being able to see and do new things is part of the magic of flight. And if you're looking for a place where the airplane is most appreciated, chart your course for the state of Idaho, designed with the airplane in mind. From the razor-sharp sawtooth mountains to the bottom of the middle fork of the Salmon River, places that can take days to reach by car, if at all, can be reached in an hour by plane. That's why the backcountry is sprinkled with so many airstrips. Flying up here is the transportation of choice for the mail, for firefighting, medical evacuation, and of course for outdoor activity. Included in these picture postcard settings is Idaho's unique system of airplane campgrounds. The state has a number of strips in the backcountry, ranging from all the frills, showers and flush toilets, free firewood, courtesy cars and caretakers, to primitive strips where everything is packed in and out. Today we'll see a sampling of the areas you can enjoy, and not only at state campgrounds. The U.S. Forest Service permits camping at quite a few strips they administer. And although not as developed as the state camping system, places like Moose Creek and Indian Creek may be the most spectacular of all. There are strips that challenge any level of pilot skill. But be prepared. Well, one thing is for sure, flying up here is anything but standard. It's a lot different. Remember when we were taught in class to stay high over the mountains and avoid the ridges by 2,000 feet? Well, a lot of the approaches up here are anything but standard. They depend on the terrain. Can you imagine looking out your window and seeing pine cones on the trees and even white water in the river below? One pilot up here had a good point. He said, this is not really mountain flying. This is canyon flying, since a lot of the approaches involve flying up canyons while you're descending to land, unable to see the strip until on final approach. The state of Idaho recommends that anybody flying this country have a minimum of 150 hours and be extremely proficient in slow flight. But you'll never forget the feeling of flying around a corner and seeing a field of green turf chiseled out of the trees. Welcome to the world of Idaho backcountry camping. The field we're landing on has been used by some pretty big planes, DC-3s, Beach-18s, and even King Airs. But most of the time, you'll see a variety of smaller aircraft here. Look at all the assortment of aircraft in here today. That makes for a lot of camaraderie tonight. We'll have a good time. You never know what to expect. Uh, today there's a mall. I see a Grumman American Tiger, Cessna 180s, 185s. There are twins and our Saratoga. Somebody said to us one time, why do you fly in here with a Saratoga? Why don't you get a tail dragger and get a real Bush aircraft? But I think the variety of airplanes that can come in here makes it so much more accessible to pilots from all over the country. Uh, by the way, the sprinkling system you see on behind us is something you might encounter in a lot of these turf strips. It's kind of like landing on a golf course, but they need to be irrigated, and they're irrigated all day long. And you may see a line of sprinklers when you come in, and all you do is you land on the other side of the field. Uh, this field, for example, where we're at is about 70 miles north of Boise. It's about 150 feet wide, which is as wide as some of the main runways at LAX. So you just land on the other side. And by the way, this field is so remote, even though it's uh, less than an hour's flight north of Boise, the closest town, which is down the canyon, 
doesn't even have regular phone service yet, and they have a charming one-room schoolhouse with eight grades in it. Come on, and let's show you around the campground, and we're going to introduce you to some of the people and show you some of the activities involved. The state of Idaho has no fee for using these campsites, but they appreciate donations to continue the program. No reservations either. Campsites are available on a first-come, first-served basis. Well, this is what it looks like when it's all set up. We have all the comforts at home right here in the Idaho wilderness. Come on down to camp, and my wife Nancy will show us around. This is our uh, lovely campsite. We have uh, all of our spices and um, uh, even our sourdough starter to make fresh sourdough pancakes. We have an oven to bake with. We have coffee and a um, refrigerator and everything of our freezer. We have um, dry ice in there to keep all of our frozen food. We have a dish cabinet, and we just finished having sourdough pancakes with blueberries. This is our tent. We have cardboard uh, containers that carry all of our clothes. We even have a sink. So now you can't ask for more than that, running water in your own tent, right? We're going to go check out the neighbors. Actually, you know, I told these people about this place, and they got the best campsite. This is the one that's overlooking the bluff and the river. Hey, you guys, what are you doing? Hi. You working hard here? <laughs> Preston. Airplane campers, there they are. Look at them. <laughs> this is what you do when it's too hot to fly. I don't think there's anything better in the world to be had. This is just a magnificent place and uh, a great place to just sit back like we do most of the time and just relax and watch the river. Perhaps the nicest campground facilities are at Smiley Creek, north of Sun Valley, where the state has built covered areas for picnic tables, put in sod, and constructed beautiful bathroom and shower facilities. Well, it's, it's really tough when you're roughing it up here in the Idaho wilderness. And one of the big problems up here is who gets to recharge their VCR batteries next? Good morning. That's great country up here. Everybody ought to see it. Beautiful country. And it's invigorating, especially when you guys get up and fire your airplanes up in the middle of the night. Wake us up. <laughs> Whenever you take off from one of these backcountry strips, you need to look out for wildlife. For example, we're taking off early morning from one of the Idaho campgrounds, and about three minutes ago, a big black bear lumbered across the runway, and then three elk crossed. So, got to make sure you don't spook the animals. Let's go and be careful. It's always best to fly early in the morning when the air is calmest in this mountain country. And remember that this grass that's so nice to land on and doesn't wear out your tires will keep your plane on the ground longer. While this firm turf we're taking off from today can add about 7% to a takeoff roll, tall grass can add 25% more. And if it's wet, 10% on top of that. You'll get to know your performance charts up here. Let's head over to one of the state's highest airports at Smiley Creek and see what that looks like. There are airports in Idaho with no trees around, but the density altitude becomes the main concern. This is Smiley Creek, right next to the headwaters of the Salmon River at over 7,100 feet of elevation. It's a thick turf strip, almost 5,000 feet long, and it's here that the state of Idaho has put a lot of hard work into improving the campground. This is also one of the recreational fields with a courtesy car and full-time supervisor. Now, if you're wondering what you can do once you arrive, take this field, for example. Smiley Creek is near some of the most beautiful lakes in Idaho, like Redfish Lake and Alturas Lake, where you can fish and rent boats. Whitewater rafting is available in nearby Stanley. The Sawtooth Mountains provide some of the most exciting hiking and mountain climbing in the country. Nearby dude ranches provide horses and gourmet meals. And you may even hear Rusty the Caretaker explain some of the local mountain features like Abe's Chair. Well, Abe's Chair is this uh, pretty picturesque mountain here and the local people have a legend about uh, the fact that when they go out to split the wood for the evening and, and whatnot and get ready for their 40 degree below uh, weather that they have in here all the time why <clears throat> they can actually hear Abe talk to them and if they finish the uh, uh, bottle you know during the course of getting the wood in why they can actually see him up there. Yeah. 
Again, camping at Smiley Creek is free, but I think you'll agree that facilities like this deserve a generous donation. The campgrounds are also supported by membership in the Idaho Airmen's Association, which anybody can join. You know, of all of the things to do up here, flying really is the most exciting. And if you've taken some mountain flying instruction and you feel fairly proficient with flying in these trees, watching bird nests go by, you may want to fly some of the real unusual and fun approaches. Let's take a look at some of them. One popular flight in central Idaho is over to Big Creek, where there's a lodge and stables. Only 15 air miles away from Johnson Creek, but the flight requires you to cross a 9,000-foot ridge to get there. Remember to use a lot of caution up here, especially when you land and you're rolling out. I remember years ago, a pilot went over to Big Creek, and he and his family had already landed, and they were taxiing up to the tie-down area when a deer got spooked and charged the aircraft. And of course, it left the plane unairworthy, and the couple had to be evacuated over a snow-covered pass. All their gear had to be taken to Boise, and they had to get a commercial flight home. When things go downhill up here, they can go downhill real fast. There's a high timbered ridge at Big Creek, which you drop behind, and as you descend on downwind, you'll lose sight of the runway until you come around on final approach. But Big Creek may be the prettiest valley you've ever seen. In the area of Big Creek, you'll find a number of airstrips to fly into, places like Chamberlain Basin, a great place to watch moose, or Sulphur Creek, a good breakfast stop. But watch your gas gauge, there's no place out here to fill up. You know, one of the most unusual and most exciting approaches that anybody up here can do is into the primitive area of Indian Creek. Now, if you feel comfortable with your mountain flying technique, this is a great approach to fly. There are uh, no facilities, just a beautiful campground and a picture postcard setting along the middle fork of the Salmon River. Now, the flight down Indian Creek is definitely one time where you want to be on that 122.9. That's the frequency for transmitting in the blind because you're dropping down into a narrow canyon and there are four airstrips in close proximity and there's a lot of heavy traffic. You'll see why Lorians are so popular up here since by now as we're dropping down in the canyon, we've lost all VOR reception. You can tell Indian Creek by the bent end of the runway. It's shaped like that to avoid a rocky outcropping. Indian Creek is long and can take a DC-3 landing, but this canyon is narrow. The usual approach to Indian Creek is to fly upstream and land over the bent end. Now, the local pilots will make a tight turn right over the field and land over the bent end, so watch for converging traffic. And again, always call your turns at any of these backcountry strips on 122.9. Indian Creek is an example of a Forest Service wilderness strip, completely isolated, with no road access at all. Before coming into an area like this for the first time, it's always a good idea to talk with some of the locals about what to expect. As we drop down, here's a bird's eye view of the runway surface, which was upgraded and smoothed out several years ago. Isn't this a nice canyon here? Beautiful. This is, in, this is Indian Creek, and it's one of the primitive camping areas for airplanes. They uh, fly in all the river runners. There's a trip ready to leave right now. And uh, you imagine going on a river trip and flying in here? It's getting there would be half the fun. Look at that. Great. Beautiful. This is one of the, the airplane. For this, too. this is one of the airplane campgrounds where you have to fly in and fly out everything. All the all your trash and everything has to come out. Beautiful. But the strip coming in here is nice, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. uh, almost a mile long. And they've taken DC threes in here. A ranger down there is down there giving them a little pep talk over here. Yeah. These river runners are about to enjoy one of the premier whitewater experiences in North America, down the middle fork of the Salmon River. They'll be surprised to see a huge lodge several miles down the river from here with the swinging bridge at Thomas Creek. It used to be Bill Harris' private lodge where he married Bobby Gentry. Former President Jimmy Carter also stopped there on his way down the river. And everything to build it had to be flown in. How do you like this campground in here? Well, it's pretty out yeah. of the way, isn't it? There's not very many people around here. I think anybody used to a, a car campground is going to be amazed when they come airplane camping into the wilderness of Idaho and see how desolate it is. And this is a campground, a primitive campground with nobody at it, in the bottom of uh, Indian Creek. And we're uh, about 100 miles from nowhere right here. The state of Idaho has given pilots a chance to do the stuff of which dreams are made. 
a chance to float down onto runways of grass to a flyer's own special area. And even if you don't like camping, many strips have nearby dude ranches where you can stay. Remember to brush up on your mountain flying training or take some instruction with a local pilot. And remember, the state of Idaho recommends a minimum of 150 hours of flight before flying this wilderness area. If you'd like to find out more, here's some information. Well, to get you started, the area we featured on Wide World of Flying is also on the WAC chart CF-16, although a lot of the pilots that fly up here appreciate the extra detail in the Salt Lake City and the Great Falls sectional as you follow the terrain. But the Bible for flying the backcountry is really the Idaho Airport Facilities Directory. It lists all the important information that you need for any visit out here, the approaches and the services available at the various airports. And you can get the Idaho Facilities Directory by writing to the Department of Aeronautics in Boise. While there are backcountry strips that challenge any level of pilot, the Idaho State Airplane Campgrounds recommended for first-time flyers include Smiley Creek, Cavanaugh Bay, and Big Creek. The Forest Service permits camping at quite a few of their strips, like Chamberlain Basin. Now, the Forest Service airstrips are not as developed as the state camping systems, but fields like Moose Creek and Indian Creek may be the most beautiful of all. They also require a higher degree of piloting skill. Remember to fly in the morning and to avoid turbulence and density altitude problems. The locals have a saying, in and tied down by 10. Check with the flight service before you arrive. Forest fires and other conditions can cause field closures and airspace restrictions. And when you get home, if you can think of a pretty spot in your own area, you may want to contact your own Department of Aeronautics and see if an airplane campground can be established there. You know, by now, I guess you've had breakfast at every local airport restaurant. What about breakfast at an airplane campground up in the Pacific Northwest? I hope you've enjoyed our tour of the Idaho backcountry on Wide World of Flying, and I hope you'll join us next time. Where are we going to head now? What uh, looks like a nice destination? Well, I was kind of thinking about Mexico. We haven't been there for a while, and there's a lot of nice places to be. You know, a lot of people are afraid to fly to Mexico, yet we've had some of our greatest times south of the border. Join us on the next Wide World of Flying as we show you what to expect on an airplane journey south of the border to Mexico. This is an aerial view of Key West International Airport, starting point for the 1992 Cayman Caravan from Key West to beautiful Grand Cayman Islands. 70 general aviation aircraft landed at Key West, each and every one of them ready and raring to go for the excitement of an overwater flight to the Cayman Islands. The one thing everyone had in common was the love of general aviation, and also the fact that they'd be flying 90 miles south over the island of Cuba. The night before, we met at the Holiday Inn Banquet Room, had a tremendous meal, and of course, had the pre-flight briefing. The importance of the flight lead is this. We're dealing with uh, Cuba, and they aren't quite as liberal in understanding as our own FAA. So therefore, it's a very, very rigid system to get over their requirements are very, very strict, and they are inflexible. So we have to make sure that we give them the proper separation between aircraft and that we maintain that separation the whole way across. The way that we do that is to have the fast aircraft go first, the slower aircraft last, and we have to make sure that we keep real tight control on our takeoff times. We coordinated very closely with uh, Navy Key West, Key West International, Miami Center, uh, and also the Comanians to make sure this all fits together properly. But the whole key is making sure that everybody is out in the lobby and into the vans at the proper time. If you get into Cuban airspace and you got a thunderstorm in front of you, just request a deviation in the direction you need to go. It's just like working in any other airspace. Tell them what you need to do. They're very cooperative and fly around it. Don't feel that you have to penetrate a thunderstorm just because you're in the corridor. The morning of the flight was standard for Florida. It was absolutely gorgeous. The sun was just coming up. There was a nice little bit of a nip in the air as we walked out to the airplanes ready for the trip south. Of course, we took bottled water with us just in case we had to spend any time out in the raft. Luckily, we didn't need it. Everything worked as advertised. All the aircraft uh, made it down. We had two aircraft that had very, very slight mechanical problems. The people in the Cayman Islands were absolutely tremendous. They jumped right on it, had both the aircraft fixed, 
and back ready to fly by the next day. Taxiing out, making the last minute preparations, making sure that all the survival gear is in place, and that wonderful moment when you move the gear selector handle to the up position and you're on your way. Of course, we can't say enough about the wonderful folks in the FAA, especially the Key West Tower controllers who made the trip so wonderfully smooth. An absolutely professional and outstanding job, especially by Paul Bergarelli, the air boss up in the tower at Key West, overseeing all the departures from Key West to Grand Cayman. Everything went very smoothly, close coordination with the FAA, close coordination the whole way down. It was just outstanding. Well, the Cuban government requires an overflight permit, and of course we took care of all that long before the caravan took off from Key West. The Cuban controllers are friendly, courteous, they speak very good English. It's a real joy to work with them. Uh, man, you'd like to have an S-2-0 Delta, I'll cause you guys problems if I climb to uh, 4,500. Take it in, uh, go ahead, John. Thanks. Flight. Ursula, oh, hello. Hello. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. welcome. Wonderful. How was the flight? <laughs> Here we are in the Cayman Islands, Grand Cayman. We had a wonderful flight over Cuba earlier this morning. Uh, even as we speak, we still got aircraft. We we're taking off from Key West, flying across Cuba on the Giron Corridor, coming down to the Cayman Islands. We've got airplanes arriving just about every five minutes. Our uh, folks pick them up here, take them through customs and immigration, and on they go, getting ready for the party tonight, poolside at the Radisson. The Southern Aviator's been doing this for a couple of years. Our staff, Mike Collins, my editor, and I come down. It's been a great trip, and this is, this is the southernmost aviator. We really think that next year, you ought to come. Did somebody mention a party poolside at the Radisson? Well, let me tell you what a party it was. The Cayman Islands pulled out all the stops to make us feel extremely welcome. The Cayman Islands is the friendliest, most family-oriented place I have been to. Now, of course, we had uh, seminars to go along with the poolside parties. Okay, Nick. What is 18,000 feet? No, that's the beginning of the positive control area. Uh, the top of the continental control area is infinity. Uh, you religious folks, uh, heaven is in control airspace. <laughs> How many caravanners do we have here? Okay, so most of you flew down. There. How many flew down with Loran? How many had the Loran work well? That's pretty good. Most of the time, half the people don't have it work very well down here. That's good news and, and bad news. The bad news is it's not going to get any better. Loran coverage will never be any better in this area, and you're not going to see any more Loran coverage probably anywhere. The good news is it doesn't matter because GPS is certainly going to supplant Loran probably in the next couple of years and certainly within five years. This is a shot of the gorgeous Seven Mile Beach on Cayman Island. Now, the seminars are certainly at a high point of the aviation uh, technology event of Cayman International Aviation Week. But the next day is the air show. Kicked off every year by Arch Deal and the Miller Lite uh, skydiving team. They always put it right on the little disc on the beach. A lot of military aircraft participating here, the C-130 Hercules, the A-10 Thunderbolt II, affectionately known by its pilots as the Warthog because it's so aesthetically appealing, and the gentleman who stole the show, the C-5A Galaxy, to see this beast lumbering overhead was Truly a unique experience. My personal favorite, four-ship of F-16s. We were also fortunate to have the United States Air Force F-15 demonstration pilot for the West Coast from Tyndall Air Force Base, demonstrating the profound capabilities of the F-15 Eagle. The next day is a very unique event. It's a little trip to the Met office take a look at the predominant weather patterns, which are usually boringly sweet, 
And then it's time for what we affectionately call the Brac Attack. Cayman Islands are composed of three islands, Grand Cayman, Little Cayman, and Cayman Brac. On Sunday, we take a trip to Cayman Brac and then a boat trip to Little Cayman for a wonderful lunch on a very, very deserted beach. After a relatively uneventful landing in the Twin Comanche, here we are now on Cayman Brac. We've got the sun, we've got the sky, we've got the sand, and we've got the surf. All in all, not a very bad place to be. And in addition to that, we've got about uh, 40 folks standing around talking airplanes. I don't think it gets much better than this, if any better than this. We've got to wait about uh, an hour or so for the boat to come and pick us up. It's already taken a bunch of other caravanners out to Little Cayman onto the beach. But in the Caymans, on island time, an hour is nothing to sweat. This you got to see. All these guys can fly airplanes, but none of them can go out on a boat. We're having a pool. First one to get sick on the way to the Little Cayman Island, he's the one that wins the bet. Well, fortunately, we didn't have anyone win that particular bet. What we did have, though, was a pretty nice trip out to Little Cayman Island. Uh, on the way, though, we did prove to everyone's satisfaction that we were, in fact, pilots and not sailors. And when it came to tying down the boat, we needed the direction of a rather experienced captain. Right down to the ground, it would be better if she won't pull it out of the sand. And here we are on Little Cayman, Point of Sand Beach, the little picnic hut where we're having an absolutely wonderful noontime meal prepared for us, especially by Cliff and Eula Lee. Cliff, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we have here? Uh, what we had here was some rice and peas, some nice fresh steamed wahoo, marinated conch, breadfruit, potato salad, and for dessert we had a lovely chocolate cake and a wonderful rum pineapple cake. All prepared right here. And it was absolutely for the dessert. It was absolutely wonderful. The reason we can't show you how pretty it looked whenever we first got here is because with 30-some people waiting in line to get their food, we tried, it didn't work. Of course, on a deserted island, there are a couple things that uh, you want to do. We play a uh, dice game called Pigs, and then Bert and uh, Todd try and recreate the beach scene in the movie From Here to Eternity. The flight back to Grand Cayman was absolutely breathtaking. Well, as the sun slowly sets in the west, here's a picture of the Cayman Caravan Brack attack. Heading back for Grand Cayman Island, Robert Owen International Airport. Going back is a flight of three aircraft, a Cessna 340. In the lead, and a Cessna 182 as number three coming up on the right wing. Two miles out, Roberts. We'll get the eight in a minute. Last year, 1991, was the first Cayman Caravan. We had 39 aircraft flying across Cuba. This year, we had 70 aircraft. Over 200 people went smooth as silk. Wonderful experience. Everything went off without a snag. Next year, we hope to have even more. I'm sure we will. One of the interesting things is to make the flight across Cuba, you have to be IFR current capable. The uh, Cuban air traffic controllers will not accept VFR overflights. One of the nice things is most of the pilots that actually make the crossing are relatively experienced. We did have a couple of uh, private pilots who got CFIs to make the crossing with them. That worked out very nice. It was a wonderful experience for them. Once you go back to Key West, uh, our philosophy has been you're a veteran Cayman International pilot at that point. Going back is a real piece of cake. Once you see uh, how easy it is on the way southbound, the way northbound is much, much less of a concern. Simply a matter of picking up your clearance from uh, Cayman Tower. They hand you off to Havana Center. Havana Center hand you off to Miami. Of course, there are a number of things to do in the Caymans other than fly your airplane. One of the most spectacular things is the quaint ambiance of the islands. That, coupled with their natural wonders and wildlife, makes it an extraordinary place to explore. They've also got some very unique attractions, such as a turtle farm, where they actually raise turtles. Not only that, but in your visit to the Caymans, you can go straight to hell. 
you can visit the gift shop from hell or you can take a walk out and actually look at hell very very foreboding rock formation very very interesting Of course, if dining is what you enjoy doing, then the Caymans is the place for you. They've got everything from fast food to chef tell. And of course, there are always the craft shops, craft markets where you can get handmade items from the Cayman Islands. Also, for those more culturally inclined, the Cayman Islands National Museum. One interesting aspect of the Cayman Islands is the large number of banks. The uh, Cayman Islands is the financial capital of the Caribbean. I think they boast somewhere in the neighborhood of 900 financial institutions. Seven Mile Beach. What a gorgeous, gorgeous stretch of sand. What a wonderful adventure. Mention flying to Mexico, and right away, what do you think of? Well, if you're like most pilots, you'll think of border towns and all these Hollywood movies filled with banditos. But if you learn the proper procedures and avoid becoming the so-called ugly American, you'll discover a whole new world of flying destinations south of the border. We've had some of our best times flying through Mexico. And if you fly deeper into the country, you'll find the real Mexico that few visitors to border towns ever really experience. You know, Mexico has over 6,000 miles of beaches and quaint villages and resorts where you can dine in the shadow of ancient civilizations. And they've got some of the best airports in the world. Join us on Wide World of Flying as my wife Nancy and I explain some of the laws you'll be flying under in Mexico. Learn how to avoid trouble and we'll explain how to follow the proper procedures. Another valuable source of information for flying to Mexico is the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. Now, if you're a member of AOPA, their Flight Operations Department can answer any questions, and they have valuable information they can even mail out. Well, Preston, I bet you're excited about going to Mexico, and you're going to have a wonderful time and see a lot of neat things. Before you go, you want to make sure you're familiar with all the rules and regulations for making an international flight. Um, the first thing to do before leaving would be to make sure that you have all your paperwork in order to go. You want to make sure that you have all your appropriate aircraft documentation, pilot credentials, proof of citizenship, etc. For Mexico, they also require that you have third-party Mexican written liability insurance. So you want to make sure you, can, you have that certificate of insurance with you. You can get it through your insurance company if they can help you, or you can go to other brokers to help you for that. Your first landing in Mexico for your flight will be Hermosillo. What you do when you land there is you to the left here, file the flight plan, either DVFR or IFR. DVFR because you will transitioning the air defense identification zone when you enter Mexico. That in itself necessitates that the aircraft have 12-inch registration marks and a mode C transponder. Since our plane was manufactured during a time when foot-high letters weren't required, we're painting on temporary numbers with watercolor paint that will wash off easily. Now we're just hoping that it won't rain on the way down there. Make sure your aircraft has a metal ID tag attached to the outside. Remember also to bring proof of U.S. citizenship for all the people on board. Passports, of course, are the best, but also allowed are certified copies of birth certificates, voter registration certificates, or a notarized affidavit of citizenship. All will be accepted as proof of citizenship. Now, this is very important, and it's a big area of confusion. It's not enough to have your own insurance company cover you for a flight into Mexico. You're required by Mexican law to have additional coverage through a Mexican company. You can purchase these policies for as little as five days and about $25 through your own insurance agent. But remember this, that policy is a condition of entry into the country. Sir, took uh, 8062 Tango with you on 122.6. Uh, yes, Brescott, we'd like our flight plan open from Scottsdale, Arizona to Hermosillo, Mexico. We are off the ground 20 minutes ago, and uh, we need customs advised of our arrival. Over. 6 Tango, Roger. We have that 
flight plan will retrieve that and uh, put it in an opening for you. Have a good flight down. Very important before you leave to file a flight plan and in the remarks section of your flight plan put advise customs before you leave. Make sure you have plenty of fuel to reach your port of entry. To combat drug smuggling, the Mexican government has restricted the sale of aviation fuel at some of the smaller airports. Remember too, it's against the law for you to land in Mexico before you reach your entry airport and clear your aircraft to be in the country. On your route of flight, you'll be heading towards Hermosillo. You'll start out by going through the Air Defense Identification Zone. To go through the ADIS, you need to have 12-inch registration marks in the Mode C transponder. Continuing on down, you'll see on the chart Hermosillo TCA. It's not a terminal control area to U.S. standards. It's a little bit different, but it is an area where there is terminal services, radar services. Continuing on, you'd be landing at Hermosillo for your airport of entry where you initially go through Mexican Customs and Immigrations and officially enter into the country. Even though there isn't a lot to control, some of the Mexican TCAs go out 75 miles, and Hermosillo doesn't even offer any radar control. But uh, when you go into Hermosillo, instead of calling 10 to 15 miles out as you would normally would do at some of the other Mexican airports, they like to hear from you 50 miles north of the city. Now, you can pick up the ATIS in English and also in Spanish, and, of course, the controllers will speak to you in the universal language of aviation, English. Aramaseo approach, Saratoga, 8062 Tango on 121.4. 8062 Tango, Aramaseo, go ahead. Good afternoon, Aramaseo. This is Piper, Saratoga, 8062 Tango. Inbound on the 352 degree radial of Hermosillo VOR, 44 DME. We're cruising at 9.5 today with three U.S. citizens aboard. We departed Scottsdale, Arizona this morning and we'll be landing Hermosillo for customs. Hermosillo, this is 62 Tango. We'll contact Tower 25 DME inbound, and also we have the current altimeter reading. Thank you, 62 Tango. Short final gear down and lock. Well, that was a pretty nice flight, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. I've got the insurance, and I have all the stuff we need, so we'll go ahead and get in there. Some pilots like to leave their plane at the fuel pumps while they go to customs. I prefer to be there when it's fueled, and I like to take care of all the paperwork first. Let's go into the operations office, or the commandancia. How do you do today, sir? Good. Um, we'd like to close our flight plan from the United States, from Scottsdale, and we need a general declaration for our plane to be in Mexico, and then we need to open uh, another flight plan to go to Alamos. Okay. Those are the three things to do when you arrive. You want to close your flight plan from the United States, fill out a general declaration, which is your aircraft entrance permit, and that's an important form you'll keep during your entire stay. It's only surrendered when departing the country. And finally, since it's illegal to fly in Mexico without a flight plan, you'll file your next flight plan. In this case, we're headed another 165 miles south to Alamos, Mexico. It's customary to tip the person who helps you in the operations office, although sometimes they won't accept the tip. And not only will they want to see your pilot's license, they may want to examine your Mexican insurance policy and aircraft registration. Hola, senor. How you doing? Thank you. We need a uh, uh, tourist card, sir. The next stop to make is at immigration and then customs, okay. although sometimes those offices are in the same office. You'll get your tourist permit validated. The pilot has to bring all of the passengers with them here. You'll be asked for your proof of U.S. citizenship. Follow all the instructions given to you, and soon you'll be ready to take the aircraft to the fueling dock. Mexican Avgas is no longer the bargain it once was. Fuel prices can average between $2 and $2.40 a gallon in Mexico. Make sure you pay for your fuel with cash. You'll have difficulty getting credit cards accepted anywhere in Mexico, and that goes for fuel also. And you may want to have a good assortment of smaller bills, since typically the Mexicans have no change. Now you're ready to take off on a Mexican adventure. Remember to conclude your flight before dark, since single-engine night flight is illegal. All night flying in Mexico is IFR.
Now that you know how to get into the country, let's take a look at some of the beautiful destinations. Thousands of miles of beaches provide Mexico with some of the greatest resorts in the world. Guaymas, a short flight from Hermosillo, has a club med nearby. Then further to the south in rapid succession to reads like a who's who of famous beaches. Mazatlan, Puerto Vallarta, Ixtapa, Acapulco. The rugged Sierra Madres to our east hide a number of colonial cities like Durango, where 64 movies have been filmed, and Guanajuato, where the Mummy Museum is. We're headed about an hour south of Hermosillo to the colonial city of Alamos, and home of the Mexican jumping bee. Alamos traffic, Saratoga 8062 Tango is on a left downwind for landing runway 30, Alamos. Remember we said to talk to pilots who fly to Mexico all the time? How else would you know that to call a taxi when you land at Alamos, you need to circle the town three times? That's the kind of information you won't find in any travel book. That ensures a taxi will be waiting for you when you land. Sometimes a lot of cabs will be there. The runway at Alamos is over 4,000 feet long and is best approached by landing on runway 30 and you're headed uphill when you land. By the way, when you land, if anybody is around, you want to close your flight plan by just signing in. If there isn't anybody there, you can close it when you come back and sometimes you can never close it at all. It's always a good idea to bring your own tie downs and rope when you're in Mexico since sometimes neither exist. And when the weather gets bad, wait it out. Accurate weather information in Mexico is sometimes difficult to get, since some of the reporting stations can be 300 miles apart. The Alamos area was first used as a camping spot by Coronado's troops while searching for the seven cities of Cibola back in 1540. The town's population flourished after silver was discovered in nearby Aduana. In fact, it surged to over 30,000 by the year 1700. To protect themselves against Indian uprisings and periodic bouts of epidemics, the wealthy residents of Alamos built continuous walls along the streets. Alamos in the 18th century was the world's richest source of silver. But when the mines played out, and after the Mexican Revolution in 1910, Alamos became a ghost town. Then in the 1930s, Americans discovered the area with its vast walled haciendas, and today the many mansions have been restored and are home to a large majority of Americans. This is the Mexico that people look for and never find in the border towns, the land of manana, where there are no tourist shops and the streets are swept every day. And Alamos, like so many other Mexican towns, has its special share of Mexican festivals. There's always something going on here. When your Mexican vacation is over, it's important to remember the proper sequence of events. You are required to depart the country from one of the ports of entry closest to the U.S. border. You'll stop by the operations office and customs and immigration to surrender all of your documents, close your flight plan, then open a new one. You know, once you take off, you're no longer allowed to land in Mexico having surrendered your permission to have an airplane in the country. And this is where the really tricky part is. Now, U.S. law mandates you've got to notify customs of your time of border crossing. You need to tell customs one hour prior to arriving at the U.S. border your expected time of crossing and hit it within 15 minutes either way. The reality of the situation is sometimes this isn't possible. The Mexican officials won't call ahead and let U.S. customs officials know you're arriving, or short flights won't allow for notification of customs. And this gets a little bit tricky. Let's take a look at a map and see the situation. After you take off from Hermosillo, by the time you can reach an American flight service station, you may be all the way to Magdalena, and that's about 20 minutes from the U.S. border, and you are in technical violation of the law, facing a possible $5,000 fine. You've got a couple of other options. You can make an international phone call before you take off from Hermosillo, if you can find a phone, often a very long and time-consuming process. Another option is to call as you approach the U.S. border. Now, let's say you can reach Tucson Flight Service right about here at Magdalena, Tell them you'll be crossing the border in one hour. Then you would land in Nogales, Mexico to clear final Mexican customs. Then take off and cross the border when your border crossing time is up, landing in Nogales, Arizona to clear the United States customs. 
Now here's another example. If you would be heading to the San Diego area, you call San Diego Flight Service Station right about here. Let them know you'll be crossing the border in one hour. Land in Mexicali to clear Mexican customs, then take off to hit your border crossing time right and land in Calexico, California to clear the final U.S. customs. When landing in the United States, you're required to land at the first airport of entry across the border. No more flying to a more convenient airport. The Customs Service has identified general aviation aircraft as the greatest threat to drug smuggling. And it's not a time to joke or fool around when being inspected by U.S. Customs agents. They have legal power to dismantle your aircraft, leaving it in an unairworthy condition if they suspect smuggling. Evidence of drugs on board can result in the seizure and loss of your airplane. By the way, they'll also charge you a $25 annual fee for processing. On the subject of fees, Mexico's fees, like the value of the peso, can be always changing. A $70 landing tax recently imposed at weekends and Mexican holidays was suspended in October of 1991. Flight plans, which used to cost several dollars, are free now, but overnight parking fees can get pretty steep, from $10 to $20 at larger airports. Some other points to watch for your Mexican trip. If you're taking a rented or borrowed aircraft, you must have written permission from the owner to have it in Mexico. Temporary pink registrations for aircraft are not allowed to be used. You have to wait for the actual copy to arrive. Remember that proof of insurance with a Mexican company is a condition of entry into Mexico. To minimize chances of mechanical breakdown and trouble, don't head south of the border unless your aircraft is running in top form. Repair facilities in Mexico are harder to find and parts availability difficult. Any work done by Mexican mechanics has to be signed off again once back in the United States. Now, if you're a member of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, they have by far the best packet of information you can write for. All you need to do is call their toll-free 1-800 number listed in your member information and ask their flight operations department to mail you the very latest information on flying to Mexico. Well, I guess our plane numbers are running off in the rain. We're going to have to repaint them again. That's what happens when you use water-soluble paint. Maybe next time we'll get smart and buy those stick-on letters that so many pilots use. And what is a trip to Mexico without some liquid sunshine? Nancy and I want to thank a lot of the people who have given us such positive feedback on the story we recently did on the Idaho airplane camping experience. And if you can think of a fun place to fly or a destination that ought to be covered in Wide World of Flying, please drop us a line. And thanks for joining us on our Mexican adventure. And join us the next time on the Wide World of Flying as we show you another great place to fly. We featured some great flying destinations recently, from backcountry getaways in the Rockies to sun-drenched vacations in Mexico and the Cayman Islands. Well, we thought it was time to drop in at our friends north of the border. So on this crisp fall morning here at Caldwell, New Jersey, we're going to load up for a long weekend in Canada. You know, here in the Northeast, we have several choice destinations, sophisticated cosmopolitan cities like Toronto and Montreal, the French charm of Quebec. For a rustic escape, we could spend a couple of days at the Thousand Islands in the St. Lawrence River. But we decided to be more adventurous. We're going to Nova Scotia for the weekend. Come join us. 44 Hotel, clear for takeoff. And when he 3844 Hotels on, they're all still there. Nova Scotia isn't your typical destination for a long weekend. It takes a good part of the day to get there, and we'll only have time to sample a few of the things that there are to see and do, but hey, that's one of the things that I love about flying. You can create and live out a real fantasy adventure getaway in one weekend. Of course, I will plan to come in a little late on Monday morning. Now, no pilot wants too much adventure, so we planned ahead. One of our first calls was to AOPA. We talked to one of the flight planning specialists and found out the procedures for flying into and around Canada. Turned out it's very simple. We also got AOPA's Canadian flight planning kit. Well, fall is a great time to go also. The brisk, cool air makes for great flying weather. And you're bound to see a spectacular fall foliage display somewhere along the way. Well, we've just hit the coast of Maine. Sun's starting to come out and uh, fog's lifting. And on a nicer day, you can really do some fine sightseeing. From here, you can see Kenny Bunkfort, Acadia National Park, Camp Abello Island, they're all on this route. It's really an enjoyable way to fly. 
direct to Halifax from the New York area would take us a little over four hours in the 201. But we're taking the scenic route, and we're going to make a pit stop in Bangor and file our international flight plan into Canada from there. Well, here we are in beautiful Bangor, Maine. It's about 35 degrees with the wind chill factor, an uneventful flight, certainly an uneventful landing. But what's not so uneventful, of course, under the heading of if something could go wrong, could go wrong, our camera plane, another Mooney, had a minor breakdown with a Bendix, cannot get started. And uh, well, as you can see, they're towing it away. So uh, we're going to uh, charter another camera plane and get ourselves over to Halifax and uh, continue this story. Well, I think we've solved that problem. We're pressing on to Halifax. The rest of the crew in the gear is bringing up the rear in a rented Cessna 210. Now, one good reason to stop at Bangor, especially if you're headed into the more remote regions of Canada, it's a major stop for ferry pilots taking planes to Europe, Africa, and the Mideast. Now, mechanics have seen and fixed just about everything. It's there seems to be a good parts inventory. So if you do have a problem, you can get it fixed pretty quickly. Now, our camera plane should join us in Halifax tomorrow. By the way, if you suffer from rough engine syndrome when you fly over water, you're never more than 15 miles out from any shore flying across the bay. So there's no need to be concerned about a long overwater leg. Right now, we estimate uh, arriving in Halifax in about a half hour. Your first landing in Canada has to be at an airport of entry, but that's no problem. There are dozens of them all across the country. You have to file your flight plan at least one hour prior to arrival. About the only difference from a standard VFR or IFR flight plan is that you put ADCUS for advised customs in the remarks section. And when you fly within Canada, you have to file a flight plan for any flight that takes you more than 25 nautical miles from your departure airport. Entry procedures are very civilized here in Halifax. You don't have to go to customs. They come to you. Advise the tower that you're an international arrival and which FBO you'll tie down at. Customs officers will come right to your plane. Hi, how are you doing? Fine, how are you this morning? Good, thanks. Where are you arriving from? Uh, Caldwell, New Jersey. And what's your citizenship? Uh, American. Have you got proof of citizenship with you today? Yes, I do. Terrific. Do you have a general declaration filled out? Uh, no, I don't. Are you bringing in anything other than your own personal belongings? Oh, uh, we just have some camera equipment. Okay, I'm going to ask you to get out of the plane and follow me. Bring in your bags, your camera equipment, and we'll fill out some papers inside. Okay, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Well, so far, that seems pretty simple. Uh, I've got all the paperwork. Uh, let's see if it's as simple as it's supposed to be. And by the way, if you're bringing in camera equipment like we do, I would recommend filling out a general declaration. Okay, date of birth, and I think that's it. What I'd like you to do is take this and put that in the left-hand corner of the windshield of the plane. Okay. Keep that there until you're ready to depart Canada. Okay. That wasn't so bad, was it? As you just saw, Customs was quick and cordial. And with one of Canada's top aviation museums just across the road from the airport, what pilot could resist making this the first sightseeing stop in Halifax? This is the Atlantic Canada Aviation Museum. It's packed with everything, from a link trainer to an F-104 starfighter, including some exhibits documenting the area's rich aviation history. The first powered flight in the British Empire took place in Nova Scotia in 1909. The spirit of that infatuation with flight is captured in this museum, which is open from May through mid-September. Now, every year, the fly-in at nearby Stanley Airport, sponsored by the EAA, attracts big crowds of aviation enthusiasts from across the province. Every September, the annual Shearwater International Air Show draws tens of thousands to Halifax. Halifax is the biggest city in Canada's maritime provinces, and it's one of the liveliest in the entire country. Built on one of the greatest natural harbors in the world, it's always been a strategically important city. The Citadel, a national historic park, stands on a site that's been fortified since 1749. Today, its cannons still fire every day at noon for the benefit of visitors who come to observe this local tradition that dates back over two centuries. Fire! Well, Halifax was founded in 1749, so we have a lot of history behind our city. And because it is the second largest natural harbor in the world, 
There is history because of the port, the port city. We have a lot of cultural events here in Halifax, being an English, Scottish, and a French area. We have a number of festivals in the city of Halifax. Nova Scotia, of course, in itself, has over 400 festivals. I would like to invite all pilots from the United States to visit us here in Nova Scotia and on behalf of the Department of Tourism and Culture. Uh, if you did have any inquiries, please write to us and we will send you all the information. The waterfront and the harbor traffic, the historic buildings and the public parks all make Halifax an exciting city for sightseers. And there's enough to do to make this your final destination. In fact, if you have the time, the rocky coastline and nearby fishing villages make for a great afternoon of aerial sightseeing, too. Well, we've had two wonderful nights in Halifax and a good time to sense the people and the city. It's clean, the people are wonderful, highly recommended as a place to visit. Of course, in the summer would be nice, but in the winter it's nice and crisp and it's, it's really exciting. Now, this morning we're departing from Halifax Airport on runway number six. We're actually about number six or seven for departure, and we'll be flying off to the, uh, to the east about 100 miles to Cape Breton. Should be a beautiful trip. Well, if you like natural beauty and the great outdoors, Cape Breton is a paradise. Golf, hiking, fishing, horseback riding, whale watching, bird watching, the beach, take your pick. The rugged shoreline attracts all kinds of visitors. That's Bird Island named for flocks of migratory birds that make it their temporary home. People drive for days to see these sites from the ground. The Marguerite Valley, that's where we're headed, makes an ideal port of entry to the Cape. Right now we're about 20 nautical miles south of Sydney, Cape Breton's largest city. And as you might be able to see, the weather hasn't really improved that much. Right now we're descending down to 2,500 feet to stay below the deck. Uh, the Cape Breton Highlands National Park is to the north, and the Cabot Trail, the road that circles around the park, is supposed to be one of the most spectacular drives in the world. Doesn't look like we're going to uh, do any sightseeing up that way in this weather. The Marguerite Airport is just about 40 nautical miles out on the 309-degree radial of the Sydney VOR. We'll just uh, intercept it, fly outbound, and we'll try and stay clear of some of the showers. And there's the valley and the airport, right where they're supposed to be. Descending below the ridgeline on downwind for the 2,500-foot strip at Nova Scotia's northernmost airport kind of makes you feel like a bush pilot. Now, you know you're off the beaten path when you can't find the public-paved airport you're landing at in a North Star M2V's North American database or my moving map. But if you're expecting a rugged wilderness, you may be disappointed. Our Cape Breton headquarters, the beautiful Norma Way Inn, the Norma Way Inn features nine beautiful rooms and 18 lovely cabins, but it doesn't stop there. The Norma Way also features a gourmet kitchen, which our crew took advantage of. Cape Breton is becoming a popular vacation destination, but visitors have been coming to this valley for over a century to fish the Marguerite River, one of the world's premier salmon rivers. Now, people here take salmon very seriously. If you want proof, you can visit the Salmon Museum. Nova Scotia, New Scotland bears the stamp of the Scottish Highlanders who helped settle it, and their traditional folk arts, knitting, weaving, embroidery, and needlework are still practiced and displayed. Add shopping to your list of things to do. But what most defines Nova Scotia is the sea. You're never more than 35 miles from it. This windswept beauty has drawn many to Cape Breton. One of the most famous was Alexander Graham Bell. He built a summer estate here in Bedeck, an hour down the road from the Marguerite Valley. The Alexander Graham Bell National Historic Park here in Bedeck, documents the life work of this remarkable inventor. Now, I mentioned that the first powered flight in the British Empire took off from Nova Scotia. Bell bankrolled the design and construction of the aircraft, and right up the street is a full-scale model of his plane, the Silver Dart. At 
After a full day of sightseeing and a five-course gourmet dinner, you may be ready to curl up by the fireplace, but don't think they roll up the streets around here after dark. Part of the unique heritage of Acadian culture is its music. And every weekend, some of Cape Breton's best traditional musicians gather in a converted barn here for a rollicking live performance. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to skip the square dancing later on. We've got an early wake-up call in the morning for a full day of flying. Talk about a wild weekend. We've seen spectacular sights, coped with the unexpected, and had a great time. Sure, I wish I had more time to spend here, but you know what? There's always next time. Clear prop. <laughs> If you'd like more information about vacationing in Nova Scotia, call 1-800-565-6096. If you'd like more information on the normal way in, you can call David McDonald at 1-800-565-9463. I don't think I've ever met a pilot who wasn't interested in finding out about new places to fly. And we've got three exciting destinations on this month's wonderful world of flying. Hi, I'm Preston Westmoreland. Join my wife Nancy and me as we take you up to a French country inn and other resorts nestled up in Arizona's Red Rock country of Sedona. Then we'll land at Catalina's famous airport in the sky and sample some of the sights and scenes of Catalina Island. And finally, a visit to the exclusive Tall Timber. Here is a resort nestled up in the Colorado Rockies, accessible only by narrow gauge steam train or helicopter. All three airports that are near these areas are called islands in the sky. They're up on mesas or mountaintops that had to be shaved down because it was the flattest part of the terrain available. And all are known for their particular tricky conditions. Our first destination is visited by more people than the Grand Canyon. This area has come a long way since author Zane Gray stayed here, fell in love with the area, and wrote a book about it back in 1920 named Call of the Canyon. And ever since, Sedona and Oak Creek's popularity has never stopped increasing. You know, anytime anybody needs a spectacular location for a film or commercial, Sedona, Arizona is at the top of their list. You know, in four months this year, there were six different aviation magazines that did film shoots there. It seems that there are always films or commercials being taped. In fact, uh, Sedona is featured on the cover of this year's AOPA airport directory. And no wonder, it's a beautiful place. A flight to Sedona remains one of the most beautiful sights on Earth. With soaring red rock cliffs jutting up thousands of feet, capped by a forest of pine trees, it is a memorable place to fly. And a landing at Sedona airport is the closest feeling many of us will ever have to landing on an aircraft carrier. Some people call it the SS Sedona. Up on a mesa with cliffs on either end and some very tricky winds. By the way, take a look at the surrounding terrain so you instrument pilots know how good your NDB approach has got to be when the weather's bad. Sedona Airport is a full service facility with a real friendly staff. The Sedona Oak Creek area is one of the great recreational treasures of our country. There are so many activities to do in this valley, you're going to have trouble deciding what to do first. You can begin right up on the airport with helicopter tours, so you can appreciate the Indian ruins and hidden arches at a slower speed. Or a picturesque balloon ride. Many people like to start with the Jeep tour of the rugged settings and attractions. If you like to hike, this area is a treasure trove of discoveries in lush canyons, some with remnants of the early settlers. Frank Lloyd Wright's famous Chapel in the Rocks is here. Shopping is extraordinary with unusual shopping centers like Talacapaki. It's a replica of a Mexican village complete with cobblestone streets and fountains. Check out the many art galleries for which the area is known. 
Sedona was the place where the Cowboy Artists of America was formed. There are so many places to stay in Sedona, it's pretty hard to choose. But one of the very best places for pilots is this Sky Ranch Lodge. It's located adjacent to the airport, and it's up on top of the mesa, and it has one of the best views in town. One of our favorites and one of the most famous resorts is L'Auberge de Sedona. It means the Inn of Sedona, a charming French country inn right on the water by Oak Creek. Known for gourmet food and well-decorated cabins, it remains a popular destination for people from all over the world. These may look like cabins on the outside, but inside, each is decorated like a warm country inn. This is the perfect place to be when the occasional storms blow through the area. For information on the Sedona Oak Creek area, you can call the Chamber of Commerce at the number listed on your screen. Remember, when you land, watch out for weather conditions that can change by the minute and tricky crosswinds that can come up. Also, be on the lookout for deer or coyotes on the runway occasionally. Five planes were damaged last year because of this. After the 1957 hit by the four preps, everybody found out about Southern California's favorite island getaway, Catalina Island. You know, the airport is so rugged that the best place they could find for an airport was to shave down a mountaintop and level it off. Catalina's infamous airport in the sky. Actually, two mountaintops were leveled and the middle filled in to make this airport back in 1939. By the way, not many know it, but back during the war, they were so worried the Japanese would land here in advance of an attack on the mainland, Catalina Airport was closed. Telephone poles were strewn along the runway, along with barbed wire and even gun emplacements. It wasn't until 1959 that general aviation aircraft could even land on Catalina Island. The airport and its steep angle presents an awesome optical illusion. Landing towards the west, the first two-thirds of the field is sloped uphill, the last third flat. Because of that, you can't see one end of the runway from the other. Look for the halfway signs along the field. One big mistake first-time visitors make is to fly over here low on fuel, because there's none available at the airport. Shuttles to Avalon run whenever the airport is open. Remember, Catalina Airport is privately owned and Unicom operators expect full compliance with all their instructions. Violators can actually be cited. Just 10 miles from Catalina's airport in the sky is beautiful Avalon with its 12-story high landmark, the Avalon Ballroom, originally built back in 1928. Now this charming one square mile town with its population of about 2,500 is the center of all the activity for the island. From parasailing around the harbor area to glass bottom boat tours, the island also is a popular scuba diving location. You can even golf or go horseback riding. Visit some of the many shops, sampling saltwater taffy and some of the other sights and sounds. There's something for everybody on the island. How about renting small motor cars or golf carts for your own tour of the area? And Catalina's got a delicious assortment of quality restaurants, too. There are about 30 hotels on Catalina Island, ranging from the plain and simple to the most exclusive bed and breakfast. The best place to stay on the island is the imposing home high up on the slopes above Avalon, the old Wrigley Mansion, which is now a bed and breakfast called the Inn at Mount Ada. The wonderful world of flying cameras paid a visit to show you what it's like. Nothing has been spared in creating the perfect getaway for their guests. You know, their privacy is so protected that taxi drivers are not even allowed to take anybody there unless they're registered. A small number of guests are pampered with service, gourmet food, elegant surroundings, and at the Inn at Mount Ada, the best view in town. A recent building boom has also added a number of newer hotels and condominiums, in addition to the older places to stay, which are less expensive. For more information on visiting Catalina Island or the Inn at Mount Ada, contact the Visitor's Information Center. Remember, when planning to visit Catalina Island, brush up on your IFR skills since the island frequently has fog in the mornings and afternoons. The worst months for VFR are May and June. According to the airport, VFR traffic has the best chance of getting in between noon and 4 p.m. during the fog season. Landings and takeoffs here are only allowed during airport operating hours. Check with flight service. Now, if you really want to get away from it all, we're about to tell you where to go. A resort nestled deep in the Rockies, consistently ranked as one of the top in the nation, accessible only by steam train or helicopter, Tall Timber. 
Brush up on your mountain flying skills as you head up into the Rockies. This is beautiful flying country when the weather's good. The gateway to tall timber is a small airport outside Durango, Colorado, Animus Air Park. It's another airport built on top of a flat mesa. Be careful landing here. The larger airport for Durango, about 20 miles out of town, Durango La Plata, is also on Unicom frequency. And these two airports are frequently confused. In fact, when we landed, two other planes landed at the wrong airport. And once a 737 for a major carrier airliner was only seconds from touchdown at this tiny strip before the error was caught. It's here that you'll either be picked up by helicopter or, if you prefer, be taken to the steam train for your final leg of the trip. By the way, it's worth it to save a few extra days to explore this area. Mesa Verde Indian Ruins are a short drive away, and the town of Durango is a charming historical remnant of Colorado's mining days. Activities range from river running on the exciting Animus River to soaring on the Rocky Mountain Thermals, or just plain train watching as the steam trains make their way to the mining town of Silverton. The railroad was built in the late 1800s to get ore out of the mine. A trip to tall timber has to be one of the most exciting adventures you can have. Threading your way up a spectacular wilderness canyon. By the way, near here is where Robert Redford and Paul Newman's famous jump was filmed. Remember from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? You'll see the narrow gauge train tracks chiseled out of the rocks, raging white water below, and then at an altitude of 7,500 feet, tall timber. A resort built single-handedly by Dennis and Judy Begrow and their family over a period of 20 years. And talk about a vacation, you won't even have to carry your luggage from the helicopter. Guests who come in by train get door-to-door -door service on one of the most famous and photogenic train rides in the world. Tall timber has golf, tennis courts, lots of quiet places to relax with a good book or just unwind. Fishing for trout is a favorite activity. Or maybe you'd like to take a helicopter tour to some of the area's scenic wonders and look at a waterfall eye to eye. It seems like there are spas everywhere you look. And there's even a horseshoe pit that comes complete with ringers once in a while. Chefs work all day at Tall Timber, delighting the guests. The food here is as incredible as the view from your table. This peaceful valley is one of the most unique spots you'll ever visit. At Tall Timber, it's one vacation you may be sorry to see end. To find out more about Tall Timber, writer call the following. Well, Tall Timber was really neat, wasn't it? It really was. I hope you enjoy watching our fantasy flyer vacations and our islands in the sky as much as we enjoyed sharing them with you this month. And remember, if you can think of a place that deserves to be featured on the wonderful world of flying, drop us a line. Be watching soon when we share another exciting flying discovery with you on the wonderful world of flying. Hi there. I'm Portia at the wonderful world of flying. I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce myself. One of my jobs is to keep track of all the videos we send out. Not just the thousands that go to regular subscribers, but also the individual orders we get for videos from our aviation video library. Some subscribers I talk to don't realize that we have a library, so I thought I'd show you our collection. One of our best-selling tapes is Rod Machado's Defense of Flying. As you already know, Rod is one of the top flight instructors in the country. But maybe you didn't know what an exciting and entertaining performer he is. Rod draws standing room only crowds to his seminars wherever he goes. You might even get to see Rod in person while he appears on a national speaking tour sponsored by Flight Training Magazine and Jepson. Well, now you can see him from the best seat in the house in defense of flying. The guy comes on and delivers a clearance so fast, I've never heard anything like this before. I mean, this is a clearance at 60 with peak gust to 90. <laughs> you have to think now, and the only way to think is by asking yourself questions, trying to establish relationships, looking how to wheedle an advantage in your environment. The controller delivers a clearance, and this guy picks up his microphone and says, Sir, you hear how fast I'm talking? And the controller says, Yes. He says, Well, good, because this is precisely how fast I listen. <laughs> 
We videotaped Rod live at one of his seminars in front of more than 300 pilots. Rod seems to have a motto about aviation education. The more you laugh, the more you learn. And it works. In Defense of Flying, Rod explains the four steps for dealing with cockpit emergencies. This video also contains a recording of a real-life in-flight emergency that demonstrates how Defense of Flying can save your life. Another special thing about this video is the price. Regularly advertised at $29.95, subscribers to Wonderful World of Flying can order this best-selling tape for only $19.95 plus shipping and handling. This tape is a must for your aviation video library. We keep getting calls asking if there's anything like a best of Barry Schiff tape in our library. After saying no for the umpteenth time, we decided to ask Barry if he would like to do a best of series. Well, Barry was flattered and asked if he could personally put together a list of his favorite stories from over the past six years. We are proud to introduce the very best of Barry Schiff. During a recent interview, I was asked what it was about flying that I, I most enjoyed. Well, I had to think about that one for a minute. Sure, I love the sights and the sounds and, and the feeling of piloting an airplane, and I relish the challenges too. But I get the greatest satisfaction from teaching helping others to become safer pilots. There is something very special about making that kind of a contribution. As an aside, I would like to believe that my efforts have somehow, somewhere helped to save a life, just one life. That would make it all so worthwhile. Well, this helps to explain my enthusiasm for Wide World of Flying. It's given me a unique platform from which to instruct and hopefully entertain at the same time. This particular video production is especially gratifying. It contains the most popular segments from previous editions. I know you're going to enjoy this collection of my personal favorites. Each tape runs over 80 minutes and is Barry Schiff at his very best. Volume 1 contains takeoff techniques, understanding spins, engine failure after takeoff, control failure, weight and balance, and measuring airspeed. Volume 2 features rejected takeoffs and landings, slips, how to glide, pedostatic pitfalls, flying a tail dragger, and accident tracking. These tapes sell for $29.95 each, but as a wonderful world of flying subscriber, you can purchase both volume one and volume two for only $49.95 plus shipping and handling. These tapes should be part of every pilot's library, and they make great gifts. Bill Cox is one of the ultimate authorities on general aviation aircraft. You've enjoyed his left seat checkouts in Wonderful World of Flying, and you've probably read his articles in Plane and Pilot magazine, where he's senior editor. Now, Bill's created the ultimate video guide to buying a used airplane. Choosing between a retractable and a fixed gear depends primarily on how much complexity and performance you're willing to pay for. Fixed gear models aren't bulletproof, but at least the gear is down and welded, so you won't ever have to worry about the wheels failing to extend. Most pilots don't operate from fields so rough that they damage a retractable's more delicate gear system, but there's no question a fixed gear airplane is better for even slightly rough fields. An obvious advantage of a retractable is better speed and climb with the underwing clean, but the difference may be less than you think. Bill explains it all in how to buy a used airplane, and it's only $19.95. Now here is a very special offer I think you're going to love. You can now purchase the entire collection of Wonderful World of Flying, 22 tapes, over 30 hours of aviation entertainment for only $300. That's less than $14 per tape. This package makes an impressive gift for any pilot or flight school. A great way to introduce pilots to the Wonderful World of Flying. So there you have it. Rod Machado's best-selling Defensive Flying, Barry Schiff's two-volume proficient flying series. How to Buy a Used Airplane with Bill Cox and the complete library containing all 22 issues of Wonderful World of Flying. Here's the number to call, 1-800-772-WWOF. That's 1-800-772-9963. Call now, and we'll ship your tape right away. Thanks for watching The Wonderful World of Flying, and I hope to hear from you soon. Earthflight, the premiere video from composer and pilot Craig Payton, 
is an aviator's look at America the way it should be seen, not from a jet at 30,000 feet, but up close in an intimate barnstorming journey that captures the thrill of flight and the wonders of the American landscape. Two years in the making, Craig Payton departed New York City and the Northeast in his Mooney 201 and charted a westward heading along latitude 40 degrees north. Craig has captured the changing moods of the land, from the dark cloud-embraced mountains to the vibrant patchwork colors of Midwest fields in spring. Photographed in brilliant 16mm film and digitally mastered in hi-fi stereo, Earthflight is available for $24.95 and can be ordered directly from Earthflight Productions, Post Office Box 158, Poquag, New York, 12570. Or you can call them at 1-800-864-3278. Earthflight is also available on Compact Disc for $13.95.